Uh, I'm Steve Shear from Carleton College, and I'm the co-author of a new book with Todd Eberly of St. Mary's College of Maryland. It's called American Government and Popular Discontent, Stability Without Success. I'm here to talk about the major themes of the, of the uh, book uh, and uh, talk also about how the book came to be. The book really resulted from a panel that both Todd and I were on. This is where we first met a few years ago at the Midwest Political Science Meetings in Chicago. Todd gave a paper where he showed that the geographical pattern of the presidential vote in presidential elections went through a big transformation in the 1960s and since that time has been remarkably stable. That is the configuration of which states vote Democratic and which states vote Republican has been largely stable since the early 1970s. Now this got me thinking, are there other things that occurred in America in the 60s and 70s that produced the current political system? Todd and I sat down and had a talk about it. And we decided we could come up with quite a list of things. Uh, uh, events that changed in Congress, uh, the presidency, uh, the courts, uh, the uh, electoral system, uh, changes occurring between 1960 and 1980 that really changed the operation of national institutions and electoral politics in a lasting and stable way. Once we sat down and began to examine this, we were able to come up with 40 different variables that we examined in this book. And what we found is that most of them went through big transformations in the 1960s and 1970s, yet the characteristics of those variables pretty stable ever since. And we can sort of distill these findings into seven basic trends that we discuss in the book. And what I'll do now is go through each of those seven trends, uh, all of these occurring in the 60s and 70s. Some prior scholars, uh, John Aldrich of Duke University and Richard Nemi of the University of Rochester, had did s done some studies of the American electorate and had found that the whole party system in America changed in the 60s and 70s. And a new party system, which they call and in an historical number, the sixth American party system really got started during the 60s and 70s, and when they were writing in the 1990s, was still stable and still with us. Well, we updated that analysis to see if the characteristics of the electorate, where parties get their votes, and so forth, has remained stable since the 60s and 70s. We updated it from the 90s up through 2012, and we found that the party system is pretty stable. Now, what are the characteristics of this party system? Well, here's what happened in the 60s and 70s. Before that time, there was a dominant party that was pretty much the majority party in America. It was the Democratic Party. It was, uh, and its coalition was called the New Deal Coalition, which had been created in the 1930s under the uh, presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This coalition fell apart in the 60s. And the number of Republicans in the electorate grew. The number of Democrats actually declined. And as a result, a new party system developed. This is sort of the second trend we see. The first trend, the end of the New Deal coalition. The second trend, uh, the rise of what we have still with us in the 21st century, and we call it a no majority party system. Neither party has reliable control over a majority of votes in a national election. That produces a lot of volatility. Republicans win sometimes, Democrats win sometimes. Uh, there are increased numbers of independents, people who switch parties back and forth from election to election. We found that there are more leaners, people who say they lean towards a party, but they're not really identifiers of that party. You know, I lean towards the Democratic Party, or I lean towards the Republican Party. Well, these leaners, we discover, really do flip between the parties year in, year out. Uh, they are what we'd call floating voters, and these floating voters help to determine the outcomes of elections. So that was the second big trend. No majority party, and floating voters, and volatility allowing each party to have a good chance of winning national elections every two or four years. The third trend we found is a big transformation in the media that really begins in the 1970s. Uh, this is the rise of multiple channels on television, uh, multiple ways of getting media uh, delivered to you. And, you know, that trend which began in the 70s is still very much with us now because we have all sorts of individual media choices that we didn't have before. And it really got started with cable television and multiple channels in the uh, 1970s. Now we have hundreds of channels on cable. Uh, 
Uh, we have uh, all sorts of ways to get uh, access to thousands of different radio stations. All those different web pages, all those different internet sources, uh, individuals have much more control over the media they consume than ever before, and that trend started in the 1970s. Now, what are the politics of that trend? What are the political implications? The first political implication is, as we said, people have more control over their own media, which means if you're interested in politics, it's heaven. There's so much political information available from so many sources that you can really overdose very quickly. But if you're not interested in politics, it's a lot easier to ignore it now. See, gone are the days in the 1950s and 60s when there were three major networks and everybody had to watch them, and there was a lot of news coverage on those networks, which meant everybody got exposed to that. Now, if you're interested in na the National Basketball Association, and that's basically all you're interested in, uh, you can focus on that and ignore politics completely. So what the new media environment that began in the 70s has brought us is an ability for some people to really move into politics in a big way and for a lot of people to completely disregard it. So interest in politics has really stratified as a result and uh, uh, there's a real disparity in public opinion about politics uh, that really characterizes uh, you know, our politics in the 21st century. So this media transformation has really helped to separate the interested from the uninterested and uh, allow people who aren't interested to really drop out of public life and elections. And that goes along with the trend of lower turnout in elections, which began in the 1960s and has continued to this day. Uh, we think that's one reason for it. Uh, now, amongst those people who actually govern us, and those who are very active in politics, we find a fourth trend, which we call elite partisan polarization. The current Congress, and I'm speaking in 2013 as this occurs, the current Congress is as polarized as any Congress ever was, what I, at least from the evidence that we have. What I mean by polarization is that Democrats and Republicans are further apart on issues than they were before, that's one characteristic. And then second of all, Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate are more internally unified than ever before. So big distance between the parties, big unity within. That's partisan polarization. We find this in Congress. It really began to develop in the 70s and has continued to develop and develop and develop to the point where it's historically unprecedented, at least as far back as the evidence we can find as political scientists would tell us. Now, also, we have to note that the political activists in America are also very polarized. Republicans are more uniformly conservative and unified. Democrats more uniformly liberal and unified. The activists are. What we mean by that are the people who contribute, who volunteer time and money, and follow politics very closely. So elected officials and political activists, political elites, very strongly polarized, elite partisan polarization. That's our fourth trend. Our fifth trend, and this is a big one, declining trust in political institutions. Trust cratered in the late 60s and early 70s. The percentage of Americans who said you could trust America to do uh, what's right most of the time went from about 70% down now to under 20%. That is no small change. And it really began to occur in the 1960s and 70s. What caused it? A bunch of turbulent events. Uh, Vietnam, Watergate, the Civil Rights Revolution. We political scientists know that different types of Americans got turned off by these events, and they have stayed turned off by these events. So that means there is less public support for the president, for Congress, for the Supreme Court. There's less support for the federal government generally, and that also produces a lot of electoral volatility. Uh, so while the system is stable, a lot of people don't think it's very successful. Our sixth trend is that there's been a rise of professionalism in government. And what do we mean by that is uh, people are making a career out of either being in government or trying to influence government more than ever before. We think this is a result of rising education standards uh, that really took off in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, the percentage of Americans who are college educated is now about 30%, the highest in history. What's happened in Washington is that Congress became a career rather than a short-term calling. 
uh, beginning in the 1960s and 70s, long careers in Congress began to occur. And Congress members thought of their jobs in the House and Senate as careers. Further, they hired staff who often made their careers in Congress. Uh, the bureaucracy uh, grew and uh, careerism occurred there. And we had the explosion of the number of interest groups in Washington in the 1960s and 70s, just a huge growth. And people working in interest groups do this for a living and for a career now. And so all of these people are highly professionalized. Uh, they've developed very specific skills, but they tend to be narrow skills aimed at particular parts of the political system. Uh, the courts also, and the, uh, the number of lawyers that has grown, uh, also produced uh, careerism in the federal judiciary and amongst lawyers. Many lawyers, by the way, are also lobbyists. Now, these professionals are interested in doing their jobs in Washington, and there's less concern amongst these professionals in trying to engage the public broadly in what Washington is up to. What that leads to is a disconnect between professional government and an increasingly distrustful and disconnected public. Those are two key traits of the 21st century political system that we think really got started in the 60s and 70s. And then the seventh trend we would note are a variety of changes of behavior in national political institutions. Uh, in Congress, uh, careerism, increased incumbent job security leads to more professionalism. And then, as I've already mentioned, more partisan polarization. So you have a bunch of career professionals who are polarized on the basis of party and ideology. That's Congress in the 21st century. Those trends really began to get started in the 60s and 70s. Um, the president faces a very difficult problem. Low trust, less certain job approval, less certain support in Congress. Uh, the president's political party has less public support now. And we discovered in our data that 1965 was the key turning point. That's when things began to go south for presidents. What we call their political capital really declined. And it made running the, uh, running the executive branch a much more difficult job the politics of the presidency much more volatile, the ability to lead the country in a consistent fashion more difficult for presidents. Uh, the bureaucracy is big. Uh, the trend there has been careerism. Uh, and Congress has abetted the power of the bureaucracy by, as Todd Eberly writes in his chapter, making deals rather than making laws. What Todd means by this is the laws are often compromises, vaguely worded, which give a lot of discretion to bureaucrats, but also sort of put them on a political hot seat because interest groups and Congress members are watching constantly to see how they're administering programs. So this has led to, in recent decades, a real politicization of the bureaucracy that really didn't exist before the 1960s. The theme with the courts is policy making. Federal courts now make policy more than ever before. And when did the turning point occur? really with the Warren Supreme Court from 1954 to 68, where they created a number of new constitutional interpretations, very controversial, that essentially made policy in a wide variety of areas. Uh, uh, legislative apportionment in the states, uh, uh, criminal justice in the states, uh, school integration in the states, new policies created by judicial decisions. Well, federal courts and also state courts to an extent are doing a lot more policy making of this sort than they used to. Now, the way to understand judicial policy making is it's different from the way courts operated before the war in court. We tend to think of what most of what courts do as norm enforcement. That is, you break the law, you're sent, you go through a trial, and there's a punishment. That's enforcing a norm on an individual or a company or a group. Um, and courts still do that. But increasingly, when courts make decisions, they enunciate new policies, particularly at the federal level. And the Warren Court was the innovator with that, and courts continue to do that. Now, the problem for the public is these are judges making policy with lifetime appointments, and there's very little public control. Uh, one thing we've seen is that popular support for the Supreme Court in recent years has really been going down, probably because of this disconnect between the public and the courts. So overall, when you add all of this up, we have a system that is, in its structure, basically pretty stable. But it includes a volatile and discontented public, a professional government that is somewhat insulated from the public, uh, and that has produced a variety of problems for the national political system. 
So the book tries to look at this overall and, and figure out how we got to where we are in the 21st century. And we really find the roots of our contemporary politics, of our contemporary institutions, really are rooted in the many changes that occurred to America in the 1960s and 1970s.